This life is a game that we all play Then I must be losing If each day is a test we all have to take Then I must be failing If I could roll again A spin of the dice Then I would be When life throws a dice You can 1987. Two very important events occur in this year which allow us to pinpoint the birth of intelligent design as a so-called science. The first event is the landmark United States Supreme Court case of Edwards v. Aguillard. In this case, the Supreme Court struck down the teaching of what was then called creation science in public school classrooms as unconstitutional as it failed all three prongs of the lemon test. The second and most telling event regarding the origins of intelligent design is the subsequent changes made to the new editions of a creationist textbook. In 1983, Creation Biology was first published, and the book made no apologies for its direct use of the term creationism within its pages. In later editions and under different titles, the usage of the word creationism fluctuated somewhat, but in 1986's Biology and Creation, 1987's Biology and Origins, and later in 1987 of Pandas and People, the word creationism, a distinctly religious word, was used no less than 100 times throughout each draft. An amazing thing occurs just after the Edwards versus Aguilar decision is handed down later in 1987, however. The second edition of Pandas and People is drafted just after the court decision that makes creation science unconstitutional, and the word creationism all but disappears from the second and all subsequent editions of the book. Keep in mind that, of Pandas and People, is the same book as the first edition of 1983's Creation Biology. This fact played a key role in the Kitzmiller versus Dover case, which demonstrated to the public that ID was no different than creationism in practice. In the earliest manuscripts of Pandas and People, creationism was defined as follows. Creation means that the various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator, with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. In the post-Edwards versus Aguilar edition of Pandas, the definition read like this. Intelligent design means that the various forms of life began abruptly through an intelligent agency, with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers, beaks and wings, etc. Now one should have noticed immediately that in writing the draft of this video script, all I needed to do was copy-paste the first definition and replace all mentions of creation and creator with intelligent design and intelligent agency. The definition in practice is no different than that of creationism. But I digress. 1987. This date is important for our purposes in this video because it demonstrates for us the first time that the term intelligent design was used in the mainstream and therefore demonstrates for us the birth of intelligent design science. But is it a science? I intend to demonstrate another reason that it isn't. Part two of why intelligent design fails as a science is titled, where's the mechanism? This is an extremely important question, which ID advocates have gone out of their way to ignore since the beginning. Allow me to explain what I mean. For any science to have merit, it must put forth an explanation of how it works. Evolution does this. The claim of biologists is that creatures evolve, and their evolution is explainable through several mechanisms that allow us to understand how evolution works. Natural selection is considered by most scientists to be the most important mechanism within evolution, and it explains the process by which genetic variations are non-randomly selected in nature and passed along to future generations. Evolution is a valid science for many reasons, and not the least of which is the fact that it is able to propose and support a valid mechanism by which it functions in nature. So, what is the mechanism by which intelligent design works? Well. Ask an ID proponent to explain it to you, and you won't get an answer, at least not one that makes any sense or really explains anything at all. The fact that ID scientists do no research, publish no papers except in creationist publications, and advance no explanation regarding the mechanisms of their theory is extremely damning to ID as a science. Any scientist worth their paycheck should have asked, back in 1987, how does intelligent design work? 
Perhaps the most important questions that intelligent design should be attempting to answer through legitimate research are, what did the designer do? When did the designer do it? What steps did the designer take to design each individual creature? Who or what is the designer? These are fair questions that any scientist would seek an answer to. Instead, ID scientists go out of their way to avoid formulating answers to these questions. They expend a great deal of effort to ensure that everyone knows that they make no claims regarding the identity of the designer. In other words, according to intelligent design proponents, the identity of the designer, and therefore the mechanism the designer used to design, are not important so long as they can prove that design exists. Even if they could prove that design were anything more than a misconception of order in nature by fallible human minds, the next step as scientists would be to explain that design and increase the explanatory power of design theory. But they don't do this. They don't want to. Why not? It's really quite simple, and it'll answer the questions I'm sure you have regarding my lengthy digression at the beginning on the Edwards versus Aguilard case. They refuse to attempt to study design and better understand the mechanisms and the identity of the designer because intelligent design is forever linked to the attempt to install religion into public schools. After Edwards versus Aguilard, a conscious effort was made by the creationist community to remove all mentions of the identity of the designer from their so-called science in order to have a better chance of slipping through the courts and being ruled constitutional. That's why creationism became intelligent design. And that's why intelligent design, after Kitzmiller versus Dover, turned into teach the controversy. And that's why teach the controversy is likely to evolve into something along the lines of sudden emergence theory. Although, in the first draft of a new book called The Design for Life by William Dembski, the following sentence appears. Sudden emergence holds that various forms of life began with their distinctive features already intact, fish with fins and scales, birds with feathers and wings, animals with fur and mammary glands. Sound familiar? It's the same definition from of pandas and people, but further edited to remove as much reference to a designer as possible. Still, it's possible to see that sudden emergence is tied to ID, which is tied to creationism, and all are unconstitutional and can't be taught in public schools. The challenge remains. Not one ID scientist has proposed any mechanism by which design works. I've demonstrated the reasons for this, and I would invite any creationist or ID proponent who disagrees to present a mechanism by which design works. Specifically, what did the designer do, and when did they do it? The question of who the designer is does matter to the answers of these questions, as the identity of the designer is directly tied to the questions themselves. For example, if it were the God of the Bible who designed, then we would know the mechanism designed by inference from the Bible. If the designers were aliens, then the Raelians would be right, and we would know where to look for the mechanisms of design. Claiming that the identity of the designer doesn't matter, so that you can further remove yourselves from your religious history, won't save you this time. You're not fooling anybody. <laughs>